Good morning. Welcome. Y'all go ahead and stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout all your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. My God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We were forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord see praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. 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 Amen. the same old road for miles and miles if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life if you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. 
We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. When there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got shame. He's a chain breaker. If you believe him, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, and if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. You got pain, he's a pain taker. And if you feel lost, he's a way maker. Oh, if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains. He's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Amen. Lydia, it's good to see you up here, girl. All right. Good to see our youth getting involved. Praying for you, sister. Praying for you. Great to see you in the house of the Lord this morning, especially those joining us online. Uh, if you're new, either join us online or here in, in person. If you're joining us online, you can go to our website, bfchurch.com. Click on the guest tab. From there, uh, Complete that short survey, and we'll be sure to get in contact with you. For those of you joining us in service, if this is your first time, there is a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. I'd ask that you fill that out. Linda, go ahead and show your guests where that is real quick. All right, there you go. Uh, just fill that out at the end of the service. We'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. Uh, but right now, our members and regular attenders would love the opportunity to meet you and those around you. So let's go ahead and get up and greet somebody that's around you. Amen and amen. If you can return to your seats and remain standing, go ahead and return to your seats and remain standing. At this time, I'm going to have Christina Doris come down, and we're going to be reading out of Matthew 13, 1 through 9. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. That day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. 
Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father. And we do thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. Father, and we do ask for ears to hear, Father, and eyes to see, Father. Father, I pray right now, Father, that you just move on this place, Father. And Father, I pray for, for those that might not know you right now or that walked away from you, Father, that you just start ministering to them right now, Father. Father, I pray for those that are hurting, Father. I pray that you heal them, Father, more than the physical healing, Father, but the spiritual healing, Father. Father, we give you this message, Father. Let it just fall on good soil, Father, so that we, Father, can then go out and plant, Father. Plant those seeds, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. You have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. All my you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will see of the goodness of God. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. So, so good With every breath that I am in I will see of the goodness of God the goodness of God. Yes, yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Two, <laughs> praise the Lord. You may be seated. So good to be in God's house today with God's people. Amen. Uh, you are the church, and we are here together to worship the Lord together. 
talking about a, an appropriately needed message today called uh, The Fullness of Life, subtitle, A Matter of the Heart. And uh, I really want to dig down into passages today. We shared from Matthew 13 a while ago and get into the explanation that Jesus gives of that passage. Uh, things have changed right here in, the, in Matthew, uh, the way the, the chapter is flowing. Jesus comes in the first part of Matthew. He's preaching to the, to the Pharisees, to, to the Sanhedrin, to the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people. That's the focus of everything that's going on. Chapter 12 just kind of explodes on Jesus when they, they just start rejecting him. They're accusing him of being demonized and on and on it goes. They didn't want to hear the word of God. And you see now there's this little shift that takes place in Jesus' ministry. Instead of speaking to the Jewish nation as a whole, now he begins to preach to individuals as well as, as Jews as well as Gentiles and, and speaking to them. And so this, this, but this call goes out first in the form of parables. So these are where Jesus starts preaching to us in parables. And the Old Testament says that when he comes, the Messiah would come and he would teach them in parables. So Jesus is now speaking to the, to the people and to the individuals and to the Jews to, to take on uh, uh, that yet, yet the yoke of his leadership, to follow him as his disciples, to commit their lives to him. And he begins to teach to them uh, the mysteries of the kingdom. But, you know, it's, it's a different way that he has been teaching and he has been preaching. But now he's using parables and he's talking in this parable about taking things uh, that everybody's familiar with, like the agriculture of the day, and bringing that out and b developing a spiritual truth and a, uh, about this spiritual kingdom. The Jews, you see, they were not looking for a spiritual kingdom. They were looking for a physical king, a physical kingdom, and a physical throne of David, which that, that Messiah would fill. But Jesus' ministry is, is, is now in, a, in such a way that he's teaching with these parables to take these earthly simple principles and build divine truths out of them. Now, I don't know about you, and if, if you were here to, in, in this day, how, what it would be like. You've heard all these uh, people telling you about, you got to go out and hear Jesus, man, you got to go see. I mean, lame people are walking, dead people are being raised from the dead, blind people are seeing, man, Jesus is doing these things, and he's just preaching the word. And so you make your way where there's, you're not taking Uber, all right? You're going to walk, maybe ride a mule or something. You finally get there, and the masses have gathered. He said there was a great multitude gathered by the sea in that chapter, and he goes out and he starts teaching them. And he says, and he opened his mouth in parables, saying, and you're, and here it comes. There's this guy went out to sow seeds, and this is the Joram's translation, and farmer, and he took his seeds, and he, as he's going, some seeds fell by the wayside, and, 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 then, and then some seeds fell on hard places, you know, uh, where, there, where there wasn't much of anything. And the ones that fell on the path, the birds ate those, and the ones that fell on the hard ground, well, you know, uh, uh, it, just, it, it was all surfaced, and, and, and the sun comes up, and it just destroyed them because there's no root. And then there was those seeds that fell, fell in, uh, you know, a different kind of soil there, and uh, they had, there was thorns and weeds there, and, and the thorns came up and choked that seed out so it didn't produce any fruit. Hey, and some seeds fell in the good soil and produced 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30-fold. That's it. I'm sure somebody's saying, to them, oh, that's so deep. That's deep. And they come up with some of their own spiritual, spiritualizations of it all. But Jesus isn't speaking now to those except who really want to hear. The disciples obviously want to hear to say, Jesus, explain this parable to us. And then he starts explaining the parable to them around 18 to uh, uh, verses 18 and on. He starts saying, here's what that parable of this. And really, the bottom line, he said, it's, it's all about fullness of life. It's what it's all about, the fullness of life. And the fullness of life is not a matter of hearing. In fact, I've heard this called the parable of the hearers or the hearing. But there's not a parable of hearing because everybody heard it. It's a parable of response. It's a parable of all of the hearts. How, how do the, the hearts respond? And he starts talking to them about how they, that, those, that seed produced fruit. If you went out in the world today and you just took a general poll, and I, you know me, I like to go to Google and ask some of these questions that I think the world asks, how to be happy. You know, well, I, what, what do people want? And that's what I pretty much Googled. You know, I want to see what the stupid people were saying, so you ask Google. So, you know, what, what are people really looking for in life? What do they want in life? And they all pretty much all came back. There was a hundred different, you know, answers to the, to the thing. And, uh, 
It all came back pretty much around the same thing. If you ask, well, what are people looking for? I named the top four, and they were the top four on everybody's list, whether there were four or 20. And the top four were this, happiness, health, wealth, and security. If I have that, then I can really, I'm enjoy, I have the fullness of life. I have, a, I have a really full life. I have a meaningful life, but I, I need these. Now, really, the first one is really dependent on two, three, and four, so I don't know why they didn't put two, three, and four before one. <laughs> because most people think to be happy, I mean, ask the average person on the street to fill the blank in. I would be really happy if, well, if I had money, <laughs> if I got rid of this chronic illness that I have or this pain I've got, or if I had security. And that's where they look in life. And most people spend all their life trying to fill in the blank and think, if I could just fill in this blank, I'll be happy. And so they get one, and it's great for a moment, but there's no real happiness. And then they try, well, if that's not it, then I'm going to make my... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be happy. I don't care. You know what? I'm going to be happy, so I'm going I'm to work hard. I'm going to make more money, and that, that's going to make me happy. Or I, I'm just, and if I have money, then I'll have security. And, and then if I have to, I need health and enjoy it. And they just keep filling in the blanks, and they have multiple blanks up to, like I said, that form on Google. One of them was 20 answers to, to find happiness in life. But it all sprung out of this. The funny part was, you know, happiness doesn't happen without the combination of the others for these people. Listen, if you're spending your life wanting to be happy, which is the natural desire for all of us, we, won't, we're, we, don't, we know we're missing something, all right? Most everybody, at least if they're sober, knows they're missing something, right? And then you ask them what it is, and it comes back a myriad of reasons, but it usually is trying to find, if I can get something out there, put it in here, then I'll be happy. And again, multiple things out there to put in here, then I'll be happy. And many of them get those things, but there's still just this, what's that missing part? I mean, you can hear, read testimony and story after story of people who've had all these things and still not happy. I mean, they're flat miserable. In fact, they're even more miserable because they thought all the things, I mean, that would give them joy, what a disappointment. You know, and they're just disillusioned now, and now they're just grumpy old crotchety folks that realize, you know, mad at everybody in the world. Don't think for one moment that you're going to find anything outside of you that's going to fix what's going on in you. And this is what Jesus, is, I believe, is getting down to the point that if there's an issue of the heart that only God can take care of and only God can fill. Sin, when it entered into the world through Adam, became the problem of every human being ever born, and we're all born falling short of God's glory, God's purposes, God's glory, and God's blessedness. I like this word happy from a biblical stance, uh, from a worldly stance outside the Bible. People would put happiness in the context of what is happening. Do I have these things happening in my life? You know, if I could just have whatever it is, and again, the list can go in. If I had this girl, I had that job, I had this popularity, well, you know, it goes on. But if it's from the outside, trying to fix the inside, it's not going to happen. There's no happiness. Happiness in the world is kind of like what, what I need something to happen. <laughs> in a certain way, in a certain time, in a certain season, and I'm happy. Biblical happiness, which there's a good Bible word for that, it's called blessed. I'm blessed. Blessed means I don't need anything from the outside to put inside to make me happy. That I have, uh, there's, a, there's a security and there's a peace and there's a joy. And Jesus, man, when he's Speaking this parable, especially as he explains it, he's getting right down to the heart of the human condition. We are lost. We are separated from God. We need to be rescued. That's what the word salvation means. We need to be delivered. We need to, we need to be ransomed. We need to be saved. And Jesus says the key to this is all he gets into is all in the context of the story. So let's look at Jesus' explanation right quick. Later, the disciples come to him and say, well, okay, what was up with that sermon about all the farmers and stuff? <clears throat> Here then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, well, that's the man who hears the word. And immediately he receives it with joy, but he's no firm root in himself. I mean, it's all superficial is what he's saying. It's just temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. 
And the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, well, that's the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of rich wealth and riches choke the word, it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom the seed was sown on good soil, well, that's the one who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now, here's the point of the whole parable. The, Jesus is saying there is an overflowing there is an abundant life that is available. But the source of that overflowing and that abundant life, you know, it's a matter not of hearing because they all heard. It's a matter of the heart. The condition of the heart determines the results of the seed that is sown upon. So we have to have hearts that are ready, hearts that are prepared, hearts that, that are, know that there's something missing and realizes that the world is not the answer, that it's not an external, something's got to happen internally. And so Jesus begins to explain what this parable means. Let's just break it down by, by definition, first of all. The sower, he defines, you know, about the one who sows the seed. He says, that, that's me. He said, I'm the sower of the seed. I've come, and the seed, he said, I'm sowing it. Now, what would happen in those, in those days in, in agriculture was we didn't have any big tractors and farmers and planters and reapers and harvesters and stuff. You know, men went out and put their hands to work. And so they would take this large bag of seeds, throw it over their shoulder, and then as they walked amongst the rows, they would throw the seed out. All right? And, of course, you can see the picture clearly that Jesus, some guy's going to reach in as he's throwing. Those, there's those seeds that fall by the wayside. There's some that's falling on the hard ground. And, and you can see all this just carried out. But understand, the first important part is that the sower is Jesus, and he comes as a sower. Sower has intent. There's a purpose, in other words. Jesus came for a reason. He didn't come in as, as an example. He, come to, he came to make a difference. And what, what he uses to make the difference with, other than his sacrifice of his life and the blood, is the word, the gospel, the truth of God's word. And he says, you know, that I'm going to show, I'm going to sow this seed, and those who really hear it, there's going to be an abundance in their life. Now, it's interesting, if you look at a little history books and agriculture of the Middle East, and all that information is available. You'll see that in ancient Israel that time, or some people call it Palestine, the, the fact is that when the seed was sown, then when it did bear fruit, the yield was one to eight. For every one seed, you see eight plants that would come forward, uh, you know, or eight on the, on the stalk or whatever it was. So it was a one to eight ratio, in other words. But Jesus is going radically above that. He says a hundredfold, sixtyfold. 30-fold. Well, that beats the tar out of one to eight. And what a hundred-fold means, if you want to know the percentage, it means that this one seed will produce 10,000% more. And if it's 60-fold, it's 6,000% more profit advantage from this seed. If it's even 30%, the lower amount he means, and that's still 3,000%, that's a pretty good return on your investment. Wouldn't you like to get that today, Amen. I, I can't be happy with one more late. I don't know. But fact is, there's an abundance is what he's saying. And the, the, that when we receive the truth of God's word into our heart, that we will have in a life that's far above what the world has to offer. I mean, radically above. Far extremely much better than what the world has to offer in this life and certainly in the next life. That there's going to be something that's produced out of your relationship to God by receiving his word. That's just the only way to, the only way to describe it is fruitful. Extremely, radically fruitful. But isn't that what Jesus said? I have come that you might have that life and that life more. So it's not just abundantly, it's more abundantly. I mean, those words were inserted for a reason. Some people would be happy with abundance. But Jesus is saying, this is, this is better than abundant life. I mean, you might get some feeling like you have some abundance if you get the happiness, health, and security, and wealth all at the same time. But this far outweighs that. This is deeper, more meaningful, richer, truer, lasting, and sure. So this is this. So, so the sower is Jesus, all right? And the seed, obviously, I think, if we've read the Scripture, we know that the seed is the Word of God. What, and what an appropriate illustration for the Bible, all right? This is God's word. There's nothing like it. There's no, there's no duplicates, all right, uh, uh, as far as unless somebody just copies it. That's, that's it. In other words, I can't, re, I can't reproduce this, 
All right? And seed's a good illustration. We, we can't reproduce fruit without seed, all right? And I can't make seed. And you can't make seed. God made the seed. But God also gave us the word of God. Luke 8 puts it this way, and the seed is the word of God. Yeah, I got it like that. All right, makes it real clear. The seed is the word of God. And so here's the word of God that's being sown, and it's sown into people who hear it, and it, the effect of their heart, there's, that's where the transition has to take place. John 6, verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And the words that I have spoken unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So he tells us that the word of God is spiritual and it's life. So if it's sown in the heart, guess what kind of fruit it's going to bring forth? It's going to bring forth life. For further clarification, Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, you have been born again, but not with seed which is perishable. You were born of seed which is imperishable. That through that seed, through the living, it is the living and the enduring word of God. So it's an imperishable seed. Nothing wrong with the seed, folks. When the seed goes in the heart, there's nothing wrong with the seed. It's the hearts where we, we have the problem, which is the, which he talks about in the, in the, the soil. So the, the seed is defined as the word of God, and the soils, it represents uh, the condition of someone's heart, depending on what the condition of the soil was. Catch this. Everybody that's been born, period. Adam became a sinner. He's born not a sinner. But everybody other than Jesus who's been born, because they were created, but he's been born after that, all right, are sinners. Now, you may be pretty good. Well, you're pretty good, but you're a sinner, all right? <laughs> you may be morally correct, but you're still a sinner. Everybody's sin. That's the condition of our heart, all right? That's what we are. We are, by nature, sinners. But the Word of God is pure, and it's spiritual, and it's imperishable, and it's God's Word, and someone comes and speaks the Word of God, our ears pick it up, we hear it, but what happens? Now, I know none of us like to be put in categories. In fact, I hate titles more than anything. He's liberal, he's conservative, he's this. Hey, I'm Christian, all right? You know, because you, you can call somebody one name, and hey, they, they may change tomorrow. So that's not what they are. <laughs> they flip from one side to the other like politicians, all right? Like the flipping pancakes. Anyway, anyway, the heart, the condition of the heart basically gives us the, the result of what, what's going to happen with the seed. So we're all sinners, but our hearts can be in different places. Literally in my life, my heart had to get broken in a lot of ways to get to the place to hear and see the Word of God. Our hearts have to, have to be ready. Our hearts have to be prepared. And that happens. We've been talking a lot about prayer. A lot of prayer has to take place. A lot of people prayed for me. Probably a lot of people prayed for you. Whether you even knew it or not, there's probably people praying for you. But the hearts have to, it's the condition of the heart. And, and, he, and he breaks it down into categories, just like poison. I don't want to be put in a category. Listen, I guarantee you, you're in one of these categories. You have the courage to look. <laughs> you know, I know sometimes I don't even want to look in the mirror because I know what I'm going to see. Right? That's why some people don't want to come to church like they don't want to go to the doctor or the dentist. If I go to the dentist, he's going to find a tooth that needs to be drilled on or something. If I go to the doctor, you're going to find something wrong with me. If I go to church, I don't want to go to church here. What's wrong with me? Hey, your life will never be better and your life will never be changed if you're willing to come to the place to look in the mirror, you know, and take an honest real look. But most of the world, they'd rather deceive themselves to think there's something that they're not and live their life that way and end up empty, cold, dead, and ruined in their life. No life ever, no joy, and what a, what a way to waste your life. And it can be wasted. So catch how Jesus categorizes I mean, this is not me preaching. This is Jesus preaching this message. And he's explaining it to the disciples. And he says, there's, there's these four soils, and it really represents the condition of four kinds of people, and they all hear the word of God. He says that this first seed is it, like the person who the seed falls, is the sower sowing, and the seed kind of falls off to the side as he's sowing the seed. And he said that, that represents a superficial here. I think that's the best way we can put it. Anyone who does not understand the word of God, and he says, and the evil one comes and snatches it away. In other words, he hears the, the Bible but he doesn't retain it, all right? There's a lot of folks who've heard the scripture in their life, but they, they, don't, they don't retain it. There's a lot of people who've seen John 3, 16 on TV. That's seed, all right? But they don't receive it. They don't comprehend it, and they don't really take the time to care about comprehending it. They just saw it. You know, it, it could have been anything. It could have been, you know, uh, dial soap, 
works better or something. That's the way it rolls off their, their brain. It just, it just goes through. And, and it says the reason they don't, all right, and the reason it kind of goes in one ear out the other ear, it's because there, there's a spiritual thing going on that people don't see. It's a spiritual seed. There's a spiritual battle. We talked about it in our, our ministry of preaching and teaching on prayer. But we need to realize that, that, that the seed goes out. It's, we continue the seed throwing, by the way, as Christians. But this person, just whether he's self-sufficient, whether he's self-satisfied or self-righteous, we don't know. We just know that there's something happening that is unseen and it is spiritual warfare. He said that the birds come, the fowls come, and they snatch that seed away. Now, boy, if you ever want to realize just how spiritual the conflict is in life, Jesus has given us a real clear picture here. He said, that it's, but it's like, it's like bird, birds. I remember doing a revival in Clovis, New Mexico, and that's up in the panhandle, you know, right across in New Mexico there. And I was at a church there in Clovis and then staying at a hotel. Now, back then, I, I, was, I was actually a young person. Uh, I, this may be bad news for some of you, but hotels didn't have breakfast, free breakfast, okay? <laughs> you had to go get your own breakfast, pay for it. You still pay for it. They just write it as the price. But anyway, I depart. I went, there's a little Denny's across, you know, near the church. So I'd go down to the Denny's and grab breakfast there in the morning. And, but across the street from the Denny's, there was a grain silo. You know, it's farmland up there in the Panhandle areas and stuff. And so all these farmers, they were, it was that season, they were cutting down the grain and, 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 and they were taking it in their trucks and running it up to the silos. And man, there was grain everywhere. Those trucks would come in, they'd be bouncing off the road and seed be coming out. And I, I mean, every morning as I came around the corner and we're getting ready to pull into the Denny's, there was all these birds all over the highway. This is a highway, all right? And they didn't care. There's seed on the ground, we're going after it. And they just all swoop down, but as soon as the next car would fly by, come, they'd all fly off, but then they'd all fly right back. So that is like the absolute perfect picture of the devil. You may shoo him off for a moment. He's coming right back, and he's coming back with the same old lies and the same old stories, but the same goal, and that's to steal the Word of God from you, to keep you from hearing God's Word. And he has all kinds of ways and all kinds of methods to keep people from hearing, understanding, and receiving the truth of God's Word. Some are easily, they just... You know, they just, you ever notice how, how sometimes it's hard to pay attention in church? Maybe you don't realize there's a spiritual battle there. I know some folks, as soon as they get in church, well, <laughs> amen. <laughs> they hear the noise in the room, and they'll say amen. I told God one time, he said, Matt, Pastor, I'm having a hard time sleeping. I said, let me send you some of my preaching CDs. It works real well on some folks. Puts them right to sleep. So maybe that'll help you. So anyway. The devil comes in and, and he'll, he, he lies. The Bible says he comes as a thief to steal, kill, and destroy. And his number one weapon has always been lying, and he, he, he seeks to destroy you. The fowls clearly represent Satan. Jesus said in that verse 10 we talked about a while ago, I quoted half of it, about abundant life. Let me read you the first half. The thief comes not only but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that life more abundantly. So you see the conflict here in this verse. Jesus said, there's an enemy to me. It's not the Pharisees. It's not the sinners. Hey, the enemy is the devil, and he's doing everything to keep you from really capturing, hearing the gospel. The Bible says, how are we ever going to escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We've got to hear and receive the word of God. First Peter, there's that great passage where, where Peter's writing the church. says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, in other words, you have an adversary, the devil, he walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. There's another passage I shared when we were talking about spiritual warfare this last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And why is it hid? Because the God of this world, that's the devil, has blinded their minds, the minds of them which believe not, as the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. By the way, lost allergies, so when I take a drink of water, that's your chance to say amen. Thank you very much. Nobody likes that dead spot. John 8, 44, Jesus says, you have your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks, he speaks of his own. For he's a liar and <coughs> the father thereof it. So Satan used a million different ways to try to snatch the seed away. His favorite way, obviously, Jesus said, is lying. What kind of lies? 
Wait. You don't need to hear this truth. Or wait. This is not a good time for you. Or wait. Some other time be better for you to get right with God. <coughs> this is not going to be the best moment because there's people around. Wait. Or he'll use fear. He can use stubbornness. Procrastination is his favorite technique, though. He can use your love for stuff and sin and the world. He can use pride, a multitude of things. 1 Corinthians 3, 18, let no man deceive himself. If anybody among you seems to be wise, let him become a fool. And you may be wise. In other words, you're not as smart as you think you are. And if people call those who love Jesus a fool, you just go ahead and count yourself as a fool because you need the truth. Because as long as you think you're smarter than God, smarter than his people, smarter than the word, you're going to miss out. So what happens? Satan just steals the seed, keeps it from taking root. The second here, he, he describes as this, the rocky places. This represents the emotional here, all right? Uh, that's, that's like in the, as they prepared the soil, there's places that just didn't get broken up. And when the seed's being sown, yes, some is on the actual path, you know, and the birds are going to grab that right up. Some does fall amongst some soil, and it looks like it's going to take root. But the soil is very, very thin there. Underneath is that limestone subsurface in that part of the world, and there's no place for you to push your roots down. And any, any plant that's going to bear fruit has to have root. You got it? No root, no, you got it, all right. No root, no fruit. And there's a lot of people who fall in this category. <clears throat> Excuse me, they've heard the word of God, and it says, Jesus said to them, and they receive it with joy. I have a lot of people, they receive the word of God with joy. I have countless revivals and conferences and ministries over the years. There's been a lot of people who responded to invitations. I am not foolish enough to believe that everybody who came for an invitation really gave their life to Jesus Christ because Jesus made it clear. There will be those among the hearers, it's just, it's all surface. You know, there's really nothing internally. They feel bad about their sin. They're glad that Jesus forgave them. They hear that message. And hey, by the way, the message of the gospel is awesome. All right? Deliverance, salvation, freedom. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great message. Set free from sin, brought into life, Eter hey, eternal reward, salvation for all eternity. And so they, they get pumped up. I know a lot of people like to hear good preaching, all right? And it's obvious a whole lot of people like to hear bad preaching. But anyway, it's just this outward appearance. He said, there's, no, there's nothing under the surface. There's no root with them, he says. And, and, and that's where we are today, I think. We're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of people who fill churches up today. Uh, they're moral people, perhaps. They may be good, decent people. But yet, they don't have a real root. Oh, they like to be around Christians. They like to talk about the Bible. You know, but it's all emotional. It's all surface. It's all just mental. It's all in the head. You've heard the preachers say many times, a lot of people are going to miss heaven from the distance from their, their head to their heart, about 18 inches, right? Miss heaven by 18 inches. So that's all it is. It's just an emotional response, and it never gets down to the real root in their life. And it never takes root, and therefore it never produces fruit. And now here's the story. As in the first one, there's another player here. It's the devil, all right, that causes them. The second one, he says here, he said it's the sun. And he says that the sun, when it comes up, they're exposed to it. They can't take the heat of the sun, and they wither because they have no root in themselves. But listen, the heat of the sun in this parable, Jesus says, is what? It's what? Tribulation from the what? Tribu everybody. Tribulation from the Word. They like that part about heaven, but don't talk to me about hell. I like that part about peace, but I don't want to be holy. Right? You can give me all that stuff on joy. Load my boat up, preacher. Tell me how blessed I am, how good it's going to be, and how good I am. But I don't want to hear that part about not being worldly and coming out from amongst the sinners, you know, and living a life that's different and a life that's unique and that glorifies God and that focuses on Jesus Christ. It's just, there's no root. And what it is that finally destroys this thing and calls it, he used this word, to fall away, they just die, basically, because they never really had real life. He says they just die because the tribulation that comes from the Bible, from the Word of God. Tell me about heaven, but I don't want to know about serving the Lord. All right? I don't really necessarily, even though it's a real good Bible study, Mike, on the throne, on the crowns, if you talk about the crowns, that's, that, that involves my personal commitment and my discipleship and my responsibility if there's going to be crowns. I want crowns but no work. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. All right? 
I, I want to go to church, but I don't want to serve in the church. And you got people saying, I don't even want to go to church. I was listening to uh, Pastor Young on the way over here. He kind of lights my fires as I come over on Sunday mornings from campus to campus. He's talking about, people don't want to go to church. He said, that's like saying, I love swimming. And I have a swimming pool, but I never get in it. <laughs> that's a lot of I love church, but I never go. I love Christians, but I don't fellowship with them. I love God, but I don't really spend any time with him. This is what he's talking about here. He said, it's the, it's the word of God that turns them off. And, 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 and listen to Revelation 22. I've sent my angel to testify unto you. This is Jesus speaking. To testify the things in the church. And Jesus, here's what you testify. That I am the root and the offspring of David. So what is this root? It's Jesus himself. And they have this external religion, but they don't have this internal relationship. And he said, because of that, when the truth is preached, they don't like that kind of preaching. I don't want to hear that. That preacher's out of his mind. You know, we don't need to do that stuff. That's just, being, that's just getting carried away. You Christians get too, get too fanatical. You know. Hey, I've never seen too many Christians in danger of getting fanatical, even in this room. Amen? I'd like one banker saying, now be careful. You can make too much money to a banker friend. Don't want to make too much money. He says, and he says, Jesus uses the word in the Greek language, they're scandalized. That's the Greek word. It means to, to fall away. And it's, this word, it's where we get our word scandalized from, scandalizo. It, it's a term which, which basically means that, that you, you create an offense for somebody when you tell them truth. And these people, these seed, these hearts that are hearing the word of God, they're really ultimately, they just have this emotional relationship. And they, when the truth comes, into the really hard. They don't want to hear that, and, and it, it, they're offended by it. I mean, more and more and more and more every day, we as Christians represent an offense to the culture. We're an offensive to the culture. I can't believe, you know, that you're so, so narrow-minded, that you're so bigoted, and you're so prejudiced, you know, against whatever, LGBTQ or transgender or whatever it might be. You are mean-spirited people. You say you love God. You know, and on and on, the, the criticism comes. I had one guy on the internet the other day on, on, on Facebook, somebody posted this. It's a, it's a homosexual guy, and he gets up and says, listen, all you radical evangelical Christians, you know, you've just lost your mind. You don't know what the Bible teaches. You ought to read what Jesus said. Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. I said, that's true. He never said anything about nine-volt batteries, electric cars, you know, pencil sharpeners. <laughs> he didn't say anything about that you know my, my cowboy boots he never mentioned them all right but he did tell us what was right that marriage was between a man and a woman and it's only sanctified and sacred in that relationship of covenant relationship you know and everything outside of that is sinful so don't don't buy into all the it would help if you just read your bible <laughs> and then you would know truth and not so be easily deceived by all these stupid arguments that are out there. Scandalized. And we are, because we live in truth, we become scandalous to people, all right? We're, we're offensive. And he's saying this particular here, the word of God, when friends or family or work associates or coworkers or employers, when they begin to criticize their commitment or their stand, uh, the pressure is there to compromise, and they will. They'll fold up their tent, in fact, to the point where they renounce it because they just want to be a part of what's going on. And they become ashamed of the word, the seed, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had a profession, but they had no possession. All right? And there, there's the difference of really letting the seed of God. They never experienced that imperishable seed, bringing that new imperishable life to set their change from the heart in the beginning. And that's why as they go down the road of life, everything they can, they can go on, they'll get in everything in the world, but they're just completely disinterested in the things of God. Oh, they got baptized, they were sprinkled, they were confirmed, they went to church, they were religious, they came down the aisle, they prayed, they cried, they laughed, they came to the service, but now they're nowhere to be found. That's the seed that's sown in the rocky places. The third seed, this thorn... This, this seed amongst the thorns here is, is the materialistic hearer of the Word of God. He said, this person hears, but the cares of the world, you know, and, and the deceitfulness of riches keep them from really receiving the truth of God's Word. So, again, first guy hears, out, Satan steals it. Second guy hears, it's emotional, it looks like he receives it, but, you know, it's gone because he can't deal with, he doesn't want to deal with the Word. He doesn't want to be a follower of Jesus, all right? 
He's got to be my friend. But we're called followers of Christ. The third guy represents a person, but this world's just too much. He, he, just, he just can't resist it. Paul wrote uh, about one of his friends like that. His name was Demas, and he, and he, he wrote to, to Timothy in chapter 4, I think 2 Timothy, the letter to Timothy, he says, a Demas who traveled with him, who saw him, who experienced the miracles, who saw the message, who probably preached himself. He says, Demas has forsaken me. And then here's the reason why he says, he loved this present world. He's forsaken. I know a lot of times as churches, we see people come and go. We see some people come, make decisions, seem so committed for a moment, and then they go, and they just forsake. And you can always usually mark it down. Well, the, one, the word was too strong for them. It, it just caused too much, ex, too much exposure to the light, <laughs> too much heat from the word. Or the world's just too much of a pull for them. That desire to be accepted, that desire to be popular, that desire to be involved. You know, just they had to go for that. And interesting, the, the, term, the term here about he just, thorns is interesting because that's exactly the way sin is and the world is. It looks so good for the moment. It's like a rose that's so beautiful and bloom. I'm going to go smell it and pick it. And you pick it and you hand a hand, handful of thorns. You know, and then all of a sudden now what seems so wonderful, you're just completely disillusioned. And you're disillusioned because from the church, because so that preacher told you everything's going to be just marvelous when you gave your life to Jesus. That you ever want, some of those preachers told me that I was never going to get sick or I was never going to be sad or I was never going to have problems, you know. And he said, false preaching and false teaching is also disillusioning. But those preachers and teachers do it because they love the world. And so they're going to try to satisfy the world. But all that does is create greater disillusionment. Oh, if you're rich, you'll be happy. God wants to make you rich. God wants to make everybody rich, and you're never going to be sick either. And if you are not rich, and if you do get sick, and if you're sad, then that's the devil, and you don't have enough faith. Boy, what a lie. And so when you've got preachers who build their life on a worldly philosophy, it just creates a greater problem. For the person who hears the seed and says, I want to be saved, but I also want to be liked. I want to be most popular this year. You know, I've got to be the prom king or whatever it might be in your mind. That goes into a lot of different areas from work life to the, to the neighborhood, all right? You, you just you start living this double life. And the Bible says there's great danger when a Christian tries to live a double life or anybody who tries to live a life. Someone says like going boating. As long as the boat's in the sea, it's marvelous. But once the sea gets in the boat, you're in trouble. And that's where we are. We've got the sea in the boat, not only in people's lives, but even in many churches today. We're more interested in satisfying and scratching the itch of somebody than really preaching the truth of God's Word, which many times it is a double-edged sword, and it will cut things wide open, and sometimes it does hurt, but that's when healing can come. And it will not come until the surgical knife of God's Word is placed in our heart. And Scripture for believers is very clear on this. Don't be deceived by the world. Paul wrote the church, said, listen, you need to get up daily and present yourself a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God. Don't be conformed to this world. Quit trying to be like everybody else and to fit in. You're not going to fit in. It's not going to work. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Go ahead and let God make you different. Hallelujah. Be different. It's not you being like everybody else that's going to reach anybody for Jesus. It's you being different in the midst of everybody that's different from you. That people start looking and say, I wonder what's going on with him. I wonder what's happening to her. Why are they living that way? Why didn't they laugh at that filthy joke? You know, why didn't they join in with all that mess? Because they don't need it. People trying to live from the outside in need it. They got to have acceptance from the crowd. They got to be along. They go along to get along, all that, and they're just empty. He said, but what happens here is these thorns, they will literally choke your spiritual life. Now, Ephesians puts it this way. Have no fellowship, and you got to love the way he puts it, with the unfruitful works of darkness. Fruit is only going to be found in light in Jesus, all right? We have fruit when we're in light, when we're walking with Jesus. Move to the darkness, there's no fruit, and you're still in the dark, all right? He said, don't live your life that way. 1 Peter 1, 16, be holy, even as I am holy. But that's, that's an unheard word in churches today. Amongst Christians' lives, we're too busy to be in holy like the world, W-H-O-L-L. Right? We want to be like everybody else. 
Now, people ask me, say, Brother Jerry, I think that two of these first seed, you know, hearts here, they're just lost. It's obvious, you know, see, steal, Satan steals it, you know, and, and then over here, you know, that it's just, it, it just it's not going to happen for them because it's, it's obviously external, it's emotional. But is this, is this guy just a backslidden Christian? No. He's not a backslidden Christian. And, but there are backslidden Christians. We all know some, amen? There are some who, and there's some who are just immature. They don't have people pouring truth into their life. But this guy is obviously not a believer, all right? It says that the word literally is choked out. It doesn't get to be planted. It doesn't get to set root, really. It just, it just doesn't happen. Uh, Mark uses a different word when he gives us this gospel. He uses a word about the, the seed was not received deeply, all right? It didn't go deep. There was no root that was set in place. Now, now this is interesting to me here because when Jesus is talking about this, he says, it's the cares of the world, and then he says, and the, and he puts it in, deceitfulness of riches. You know, I, I think probably in this culture that we live in, there's probably no greater barrier to the gospel than the deceitfulness of riches for most people. They're so preoccupied with the almighty dollar. Their life revolves around it. Their fears revolve around it. Their hopes revolve around it. Their desires revolve around it. If I just had more money, I'd be happy. And they just think, you know, that I'm just not going to, the spiritually, that's thing, that's not that spiritual life, that's not going to work for me. I need more in my life. And he says, it's the deceitfulness of riches. What did Paul warned, he says, it is the love of money. And Jesus, he makes a point about it as well. It's the love of money that's the root of all sorts of evil. Paul wrote, went on to write in 1 Timothy, he said, and some by longing after it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many a pang. That's the thorns. John wrote it this way, do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, and those are strong words, if your love is more for the world than it is for God, the love of the Father is not in you. Now, that means you really don't know Jesus. Romans goes on later to tell us, I mean, earlier when Romans is written, and it says that, hey, when we come to Christ, that we receive Jesus by faith, and the love of God at that point is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But if I don't have the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, then I don't, I'm not his. I can be religious. I can be, you know, masterful perhaps in understanding Bible things to some degree. He says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. He said, and he tells why. Because all that's in this world, and this is so great how it lays it out, the lust of the flesh, Got to have, have, have. I just need to satisfy these desires. Or the lust of the eyes, I just need more. The lust of the eyes are the boastful pride of life. Putting yourself above everybody else and others. Just that narcissist mindset that the world lives in today. All about you. He said, that's not from the Father. That's from the, that's from the world. Now, the, there's the good soil here. All right? It represents the true hear of God's word. And put it this way, and put the, it represents the ready here, the prepared here, the heart that's open. Now, I know in my own life, that was a process. And most of you as well, when you came to Jesus. Some of you gave your life while you were young and tender. Some of you were old and hard, like, you know, down the road. In fact, most salvation decisions are, are, are anymore are by the young and tender, all right? 12 and below. That's the majority of real salvation decisions. A lot of people, it was it's later in life for them. So what has to happen in that situation, we have to get tenderized and praise God for his goodness that he'll bring us to the place of just getting broken in our life. We get to the end of ourselves and our life where we just realize we need God. That fourth soil, that's, that's the good soil, and it represents that heart who's heard the word of God, has received it, and, is, and, and God is bringing forth fruit. You don't only hear it, you understand it, and you experience this life, this abundant life that he's speaking about that literally changes your mind. You have joy. It doesn't depend on health. It doesn't depend on stuff. It doesn't depend on circumstances anymore. It depends on this relationship that you, you have with the Lord. This is an internal thing that has happened. You're not waiting for something else to happen out here. And even as a Christian, it's really, it's really easy to get your eyes off those internal things, your relationship with the Lord, and start thinking, you know, if I had that, or if I had that, it would be nice to get that, the deceitfulness of riches, deceitfulness of stuff. Don't be, don't be sucked in by that. The good soil... 
focuses on the one who sows the seed, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, he hears and understands. I got like this. It's King James. But also, indeed, bears fruit. He bears fruit in reality. That's the distinguishing mark of the believer. The good soil is fruitful soil. Now, in the Bible, I'm not going into all this, but there's basically two kinds of fruit in Scripture. One is the fruit that, that is what we're talking about, I believe, the context of this, the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the meekness, the, the, the gentleness that God puts in a person's heart, those, those ad, the, the aspects of the, the character of the Lord Jesus. That's, part, that's pretty much the Holy Spirit's job in our life is to manifest that fruit through us so that we experience that in our walk, all right? Then I believe there's an external fruit where that by we are now sowers and we're sowing seed and people are coming to Christ. Listen, this church will die in about 10 more years if people don't get off the behind and start sowing seed. And yes, that means you. Amen? You better get to sowing seed. And you better get radical about sowing seed. And that means standing for Jesus, loving Jesus, and sharing Jesus. If you're just a person who just enjoys coming in, hitting Brother Joe, jump up and down, spit and cough in his face, you know, and, 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 hey, good for you, but that's not going to do anything for the kingdom of God. We need to be busy about building God's church and God's kingdom. That's why we are here, folks. If it wasn't so, he'd taken us on out of here. Amen. We'd already be in heaven. But there are people around you that God wants you to make this difference in. And for you to make that difference in, you've got to let him make that difference in you. Here's the beauty of this, where he talked about where John said, lust the eyes, lust the flesh, the pride of life. Hey, the, the Bible teaches this man had a threefold enemy. Well, I didn't want to see that. Can you show me the thing? Oh, thank you. <laughs> a threefold enemy in this parable. One, the devil. First here, Satan still sees. Second, the flesh. Second here, emotional here, takes it more than the emotion. Rather just all on, on surface. Third, the world. But this is exactly what Jesus talked about. The lust of the flesh, you know, the pride of life, Satan's attack. All this is wrapped up in what John just gave us a while ago. Don't let any of these things distract you. Closing remarks. End of the sermon. Before the invitation, Jesus says, He who hath ears, let him hear. Pay attention. Not just with this organ, but with the heart. It's not the ears. They all got it in the ear. They just didn't get it in the heart. We need it to be a heart message that's received that means I mean business. When I came to Jesus and gave my life to him, I didn't know really any other thing. That's the only message I knew that the Bible taught about. Hey, it's get on board or get off board. You know, it's kind of paint or get off the ladder kind of thing. If you're going to live for Jesus, live for Jesus. Quit standing around talking about living for Jesus. If you're going to be what God's called you to be. I, I sat down at lunch with a guy who served on the International Mission Board, and he was kind of asking me about my call to, South, to, to pastor. How did you know you were called a pastor? And I don't know if my, my testimony really made him happy. I said, I think what you're asking me is, what was that critical moment after I became a Christian, you know, of, of realizing that I was supposed to preach the Word of God? And I said, you know, I, I think it's like when somebody, you've heard people tell the story, you know, oh, I wrestled with it. And that's fine because that's what happens to most. All right, we... we we start realizing, hey, God's got a bigger purpose in my life. There's what he wants. And then there's that conflict we deal with. I'm going to walk away from this. I have to trust God here. That's reality. But in my situation, I realized I had nothing to start with. You know? There's just nothing to start with. And I just, I, I, that's what I thought it meant to get saved. Just go on board. Just go out. Go, go, go live for Jesus. Go tell everybody about Christ. It's the most minor. Uh, we have a friend, Kathy, and I do. Uh, uh, I think she shared with our church many early years ago, Iris Blue. Uh, she said, you know, now that I gave my life to Jesus, I called the Salvation Army and wanted to know where my uniform was. <laughs> she said, that was my understanding. Now I go to work for Jesus. I got saved. Now I'm going to serve the Lord. That's reality, folks, though. That might not be your reality, but that's it. We're all called to serve God. So we just get on board. And I said, listen, I, that's all I knew to do. And, said, and, then, and God just began to open doors. I said, I don't, he said, well, 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 because I said I wasn't called. I was tricked. <laughs> just, just what the Lord did. And everybody's different experience. But I do know this. Our salvation's all the same. We're all called to, to completeness. And that's where those messages Gary's been preaching on discipleship are so true and so lost in the culture today. We have this kind of mindset that we can just kind of sign up for heaven, but I'm not going to walk under Jesus. I'm not going to be a disciple. 
Well, James was warning about that in James 1. And let me just give you a living translation of James 1, 22 and 25, that part about looking in the mirror and seeing yourself or forgetting what you saw. Living Bible says, remember, this is a message to obey and not just listen to. That's good. So don't fool yourselves. If your person just listens and doesn't obey, he's like a man that looks in the mirror's face and as soon as he walks away, he ain't see himself anymore or remember what he looked like. But if anyone keeps looking steadily into God's law for free men, in other words, the word of God, you will not only remember what you saw, but you will do what the book says, and God will greatly bless you in every work you do. Oh, that's powerful. Because that's, that's some things we just don't realize, that this is a mirror. And every one of you today saw yourself in one of those passages. And Satan's already tried to steal that from you. <laughs> but every one of us fall in those categories. All right? And if somehow we say, well, I used to be there, but I'm kind of moving here. Hey, then move back to where you're supposed to be as a sower of the seed of, and someone who is blessed in every work that you do. We don't like to be categorized, but Jesus categorized those hearts before, for us, all right? Now, I don't know how you came in here, in your heart at least. But it's not important how you came in. Some of you may come in a mess. Some of you may have come in and say, you know, I've been that emotional here all my life. I've never really made a real strong decision for Jesus in my heart. Some may say, you know, I just, I, I want to, but there's just too much out there. I don't want to turn away from it. At least you're being honest. But you're being deceived. You need to take a close look at your life. There's no fullness. It's not going to be there without Jesus. There's no 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. You say, well, what makes the difference between those? That's another sermon. I think it has to do with just at what level of faithfulness we really, really walk in. But if you do know Jesus, you're going to bear fruit. All right? So I, I don't know. But you know your heart. And there finally came a day when I quit deceiving myself about my heart and let God really open it up and speak to me and show me where I was really at and show me that all this stuff I've been trying to do to make myself, myself happy on the inside, coming on the outside, wasn't working, and I was miserable. The only time you're ever going to come to life is when you finally come in and say, all of me, Jesus. Take all of me. I need you. Every hour I need you. That's when you start realizing it. I got nothing to bring. I got nothing to offer. I got nothing to give except this shell of a man. Well, here it is. And thank you, Lord, that you love me and receive me and wash me and cleanse me, fill me, and make me fruitful. That's the joy of the Lord in our life, that fruit, then it begins to be spread. So, I mean, if you just be honest, say, that's where I am. And then as, as you look at that, be willing to make the decision that needs to be made. What kind of heart do you have? I can look real quick because there's no real fruit of life when the, the heart is not right. Amen? Our man's going to come. I want you to stand as we pray. And I want to say to you the same thing Jesus says to all of us. We better listen if we have ears. If you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says. The book of Revelation, God's final word to the nations, is those same words, hear what the Spirit says. In the very closing chapter of the Bible, he's speaking still. He said, the Spirit's calling. Have ears to hear. So all the way up to the days of which are not far in front of us, folks, of tribulation like the world's never seen. It's amazing how the Spirit's still working in people's hearts and minds and how much God really loves humanity and really loves you and wants to do that deeper work in your life. Would you bow your heads with me? And as you bow your head before the Lord there, I'd ask you to be honest about your heart. Can you answer the condition of your heart today? Pastor Gary's coming. I'll be here. I'd love to pray with you. If it's just between you and the Lord as a Christian, maybe you say, I've seen that call from the world, the flesh, the pride of life. I just want to get my heart right. Do that today. Move back to that place of fruitfulness, not just 30 fold, 100 fold, being what God's called you to be. Serve the Lord with gladness, the scripture says. But it starts with the heart. If the heart's not in, it's not going to happen. The Bible says backslider in heart's filled with his own ways. Don't be that backslider in heart. If you don't have a heart that's ever been given to Jesus, Listen, come, let's pray with you. I want to give my life completely to Christ. I don't want to go through these motions, emotions. I want Jesus for reality. Come give your life to Christ.
Maybe you just want someone to pray for you, pray with you. We'd be glad to do that. Maybe there's a special need you'd like to lift up. Let's do that. We're here for the Lord. We're here for you to receive from the Lord what he has for you. And you want to pray with somebody, bring them to the altar. Feel free to. And you look for a church home. That's where the Lord's been leading you. Step out, come. But be open to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to your heart today. Be a heart that's ready to hear and receive. You come. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no of the goodness of God. Yes, yes, I will see of the goodness of God. Father, we love you. As we gather here this morning, Lord, may our hearts be touched by your Holy Spirit. May that seed fall on soil that's ready to hear. And may we walk out of here realizing that we also have been called to be ambassadors for the kingdom to be the sores of the seed in this culture. Lord, I know there's great resistance in this day and age. But God, we will not compromise, nor will we choose to live cowardly lives. So fill us with the courage and the boldness and the life and the life that we need. In Jesus' precious name, we praise you. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Oh, say it louder than that. Amen. You may be seated. Man, God is so good to us. I hope you're on board because God is a, I really have an anticipation. I think Gary said this at our leadership dinner, uh, some, some things that the Lord's getting ready to, to do in our midst and in our presence. But it does require, as I said in my sermon, you know, I wasn't just preaching. <laughs> Something I always just preach. I really mean it. Any church that's going to survive in this kind of 
climate culture that we're facing is going to have to be filled with people who are serving the Lord, not a pastor. People don't come to hear a great preacher. If we had had one other than Gary, you know, it'd be great. But they don't come. Because, they don't even come because of a great children's program. A great. We don't have those great programs to draw people. We have those great programs to minister to the people that are here. All right. What draws people is people. We all are the lights in that dark place in the culture that we're in every day. So shine there. Amen. Well, I'm afraid if I shine, they might ask me a question. I don't know. People ask me questions every day I don't know. I just tell them like my mama, go look it up. <laughs> how do you spell that, mama? Go look it up. I don't know if she didn't know how to. I think she knew. She just wanted me to go look it up. So go look it up and be what God called you to be. And it never hurts to tell somebody, you know, I'm not quite sure about that. Let me go check that out. I say that often. I'm sure you do as well. But go check it out and get back with the answer. Jesus is that's interesting. How about Jesus is Lord? <laughs> Same thing. Jesus is good. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. And man, Jesus is mine. Praise the Lord, Brother Gary. Amen. Amen. All right. If I can get about four minutes of your time so people don't run out. I know like people we have after church ministries and everything like that. But let me get about four minutes of your time here. Uh, first thing is, of course, our lift uh, continues tonight at 5. We already had our morning group. We'll have another group this evening. Uh, last week was the first lesson. This is lesson two. And it talks about that royal crown that Jesus wears, that crown of victory. And so you don't want to miss tonight's lift lesson as we go through the crowns. And so we also hit on uh, prayer and what it means to be in prayer and why we pray and, and, and that, that conduit that we have with God when we're in prayer and why sometimes... God doesn't hear our prayers, uh, and so it's going to be a, it is a great lift lesson, so you don't want to miss it. Also, our Youth in Awana starts at 515. Our Wednesday night service, we're going through the Harmony of the Gospels. More specifically, we are going through the Beatitudes, and last week we covered uh, Blessed are the Meek. Now, meek does not equal weak. And so if you were here last week, you would have, known, you would have learned that. Uh, but this week is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And I'm not going give, to give the card away, but it, it, we have to hunger and yearn for God's word. And when we do that, our thirst is satisfied. And so you don't want to miss this Wednesday as we go into the Beatitudes. Uh, only love matters. Now, I've talked to quite a few people, and they say, yeah, I'm coming. But I asked Pastor Tim, hey, did so-and-so sign up, and they haven't signed up. We don't know if you're coming unless you sign up. And so there's a QR code, and there's a, a handwritten registration form out there in the lobby for you to pick up. Now, you can sign up for the marriage retreat this week, and next week I'll have a sign-up sheet out there for marriage counseling, okay? Because typically what happens with those that don't go to the marriage conference it's coming because just like our Christian walk in our marriage, we're in the valley, coming out of the valley, or getting ready to go into another valley. They said, well, I don't need it. I don't need it. You don't need it today, but it's coming. And, and so sign up. Sign up because, again, I'll have a sign-up sheet out there for marriage counseling. And if, if I find out that you didn't sign up, I'm charging you, just so you know. Amen? All right. It's going to cost a lot more than $50. So there you go. All right. Um, also, sign up if you want to help out with uh, hosting the Magnolia uh, Marriage Conference the week of the twenty, the twenty ninth, the thirtieth, and the th and the first. And, and so, more details. Sandy's got information out there. We're also looking for door prizes. Um, and, and so, if you know of, of a business, or you can go by a place where you eat, and maybe they donate, you know, twenty five dollar gift card or whatever. We'll just put those that in the giveaways. Uh, for our online, uh, don't forget to stay connected via Facebook, YouTube, BF Church. Also, for our first-time visitors, don't forget to take that welcome card. I'll meet you out there in, in the foyer out there. Put, your, put a free gift in your hand. Don't forget your tithes and offerings are godly given. And I wrote this down because this came to mind. As we mature in Christ, we should be cultivating a generous spirit. You know, and, and Pastor Joe talked about that, about the love of money. For us to be content 
is not, is not to desire more, but to desire less. To love God more means to, less, to love other things less. And, and so when we grow in Christ and mature in Christ, we need to cultivate that, that spirit of giving. And that comes from our godly giving and offerings. Amen? And so don't forget your tithes and offerings. Uh, with that being said, don't forget our evening activities, three ways to give. Of course, you can see it behind me. You are dismissed. Yes, hold on. Don't leave yet. Miss Margaret has a word to say, so I'm going to let her say it. Let's go right down here. Praise Come up here. God for this church. Yes. Praise God for the, for the leaders, for our pastoral staff, and for each of you. Thank you so much for the celebration that you gave my son. It was a rejoicing time, and I thank and praise God for each of you. Have a blessed day. Now you're dismissed.